This is a Brunch Pre-Oscars mini-podcast to contain spoilers, but we can't imagine you care if you haven't seen the movie and you're afraid of spoilers. There's no way you would logically seek out a podcast about the movie. Let us begin. The Holdovers. Directed by Alexander Payne is the warmest and nicest movie. It has a runtime of two hours and 13 minutes and the highest Rotten Tomatoes score of the Best Picture noms at 97 It's got an audience score of 91. It's nominated for five Academy Awards. Best Picture, Best Actor, Paul Giamatti. Best Supporting Actress, Divine Joy Randolph. Best Original Screenplay. That equals five, I think. Anyway, uh, yes, it's got the highest Rotten Tomato score of all the noms because as we do this for the third time, which we'll explain in a minute, uh, this movie is why Air was not nominated for Best Picture because they made a movie that even more people would have a hard time not approving on Rotten Tomatoes. This is the perfect encapsulation of what Rotten Tomatoes is. Like, because it is a, what, a 97% on Rotten Tomatoes, you said? Yes, 97. It is a a 97% on Rotten Tomatoes, which means that 97% of people liked this movie not that it's 99 not that it's a 97 out of 100 as is often confused with rotten tomatoes it does not surprise me that this is the most liked movie or like highest percentage liked movie of the uh best pictures this year because this is an impossible movie not to like we i feel like we started saying the word inoffensive all the time with movies after we saw air yes but it can become an insult to call a movie inoffensive this movie is why we love inoffensive movies and you should love inoffensive movies it it can't rally up too much maybe there can be some things with like for children of divorce who it could uh, with whom it could hit close to home but ultimately it's just somebody taking a chance on somebody else two people that are stuck with each other and boy oh boy they learn to love each other because at the end of the day we're all just people and It's got a lean cast. There's four characters, essentially. They've all been hurt in different ways, and they're all just trying to get this through this crazy thing that we call life. It's a reunion between Alexander Payne and Paul Giamatti, which anybody is going to love because those two absolutely rock, even though, as again, I'll say in a second why we're doing this for the third time. Uh, As we've said in past discussions about this movie, I don't love all of Alexander Payne's stuff. I love him. Downsizing downsizing is one of my least favorite movies of all time. And I don't like Nebraska. But he's made stuff with Paul Giamatti that I love. So forever, I will love him. You could could be terrible, but if you win me a cup in one season, you're you're never paying for a drink in my town. Alexander Payne uh, gets the best out of Paul Giamatti. We have two cases of that now with Sideways and this movie. And if... It, there's never been a role that has been more obviously designed and uh, shaped for a specific specific actor than this one, uh, the the role that Paul Giamatti plays, which is a curmudgeon professor. It is the most perfect uh, Paul Giamatti role of all time. And I will take as many of those movies as Alexander Payne and Paul Giamatti would like to give me because, boy... Nothing is better than Paul Giamatti at his best. Just nothing. He uh, The betting odds at last check were minus 500 for him to win Best Actor. Yeah, or I'm sorry, uh, plus 500 to win Best Actor. Killian Murphy is minus 1,000. This at least is kind of a close-ish one. Paul Giamatti has the second best odds. I know plus 500 sounds like somebody's a huge long shot, but when it comes to Academy Awards type things, if it's triple digits... It's a conversation. At yeah. least. I don't think that Paul Giamatti is going to win. I think that Killian Murphy is going to win because I think that Oppenheimer, in a lot of cases, rightfully, is going to absolutely win everything. But that's OK. Mm-hmm. This movie, I think, maxes out a generally, again, trite is often said derogatorily, uh, let's say basic or easy to understand accessible idea but it maxes it out so much before i say it for the fourth time or fifth time i will say this is the third time we're recording an episode about uh, or or a specific review about the holdovers one we did normally and that's out there from months ago a second we did for the oscars mini podcasts and we had audio issues that of course were not uh made aware until or did not uh show their faces until 
or I guess if it's audio issues, make their screeches heard until post-production. So this is the second time we're doing a mini episode about it. But in all of our conversations, we've said this isn't going to rock your world, but it's going to make your world better. It was not my favorite movie of 2023, but it was my most recommended movie because, again, there's nobody that's not going to like this movie. And when it came out and like the time in which it like took a hold of me was dead in the middle of winter. And you mentioned it at the top of this episode. This is the warmest movie of the year. And I just like I love the aesthetic of this movie. It's shot like an old movie. It sounds like an old movie. You can explain that in a minute. You explain that to me uh, before. And it was a a wild revelation to kind of to get. But it does make sense. So like it everything looks amazing. It's well performed. You're right in that it's like it's not really reinventing the wheel and it does max out a pretty basic plot and um you know it it's just just so fucking it's so fucking lovely <laughs> this movie is just like a warm hug in the middle of winter and i i do recommend i'm sorry that if you, you haven't seen it yet and you missed like the dead of winter viewing it it may have a different effect on you uh, or hit l- less hard if you watch it in the spring or the summer or whatever, this is the perfect movie to watch in the middle of winter because it does take place during Christmas. It is very warm and in the way that it's shot and the way that it's presented. So that is something that I wish I could give to anybody who hasn't seen it yet. Though I, though I'm hardly a, a drinking man these days, this movie is mac and cheese, heavy beer, and maybe you bring the blanket to the couch sort of mm-hmm. viewing. That is the be- or bringing the comforter to the couch is the absolute best. Do you ever do that? Yes, yes. Not That's the comforter, but like, but like a like a heavy blanket, a heavy right. blanket or a weighted blanket on the couch in the middle of winter with the heat cranked a little bit. Mac little and cheese. Pot. This is a great pot dark. movie, by the way. This oh, is a it's true. Tremendous, a pot tremendous pot movie. Uh, this has oh um on on the audio thing, it's mixed in mono, so it doesn't have any fancy bells and whistles sound wise because they want it to feel as let's say 1971 which is when i think it's set as possible so they basically tie one of their hands behind their backs from a production standpoint but at the end of the day it really feels like you're watching something that was made back then and uh, the sound is a huge part of it so that that's why i wish i know that it wouldn't win i wish it were nominated for best sound even though that's like a choice that they made the sound shitty i could see that that's why people would argue against it being nominated for best sound but i like the i I like the move and i like how ballsy it is to say yeah that's going to be lower quality but we're making it lower quality on purpose this has the third best batting odds which i think kind of makes sense because you'll say all right there's a heavy favorite Oppenheimer at minus 5,000 now. When we first started doing these a week ago, Oppenheimer was minus 2,500. So it's become more of a runaway favorite. And everything except for, I think, the zone of interest and maybe one other thing. Uh, Yeah, everything except for zone of interest has moved up. Maestro has moved down. Everything else has moved down. But I could see why they'd say, yeah, if Oppenheimer doesn't win, which it's going to win, give me the craziest movie, poor things. Give me the safest movie, the holdovers, and there's your top three. It yeah, won't I think win. This is but, the safest movie. Yeah. Yeah. And like when a movie that's th- this warm and like gives you such a good feeling is nominated, it's got to, not that like disability needs to be involved, but like it's got to be Coda to. It's got to have some like real heart wrenching shit. Not that every character in this movie doesn't have their own plights. Like there's obviously it, it's more, like a it's a light scent about, of sadness for the yeah. most part, and it's not it doesn't hit you over the head with sadness, right? And like Coda, for I think the average person maybe like learns a lot about like a community about which they might not know if they 
haven't uh, met a, a, a ton of people that have to sign as much as the cast of Coda does. And Troy Kotzer's not in this, so no shot. But, I'll, I'll tell you who but, does have a shot. Who? Yeah, but. I was going to say, you mentioned the word. I didn't want to get too far removed from you saying the word ballsy because this movie is ballsy in a few different ways. One of the ways is the casting of Dominic Sessa, who was literally basically picked off the street. And it's his first role in a in a movie. And I thought he was great. He was really, really good. Yeah, he was. I, I want to see more of him. I hope that a star is born there. I think one is. If I, I mean, like 25-year-old dudes are for sure making like fan cams of him. Like the like film bros love Dominic Sessa. Well, I mean, this movie takes place in the 70s and he looks like he just exited a time mm. machine from the 70s. And I'm pretty sure that's a pretty big reason why he was selected for the role. But I mean, good for him. And I wonder at, at some point, maybe does he transport to the present day as a person uh, or if he's going to be like kind of typecast in those roles where he plays like dazed and confused stuff get him with richard link later and he's gonna yes. be uh he's gonna eat for the rest of his life divine joy randolph who really is the only woman for the most part in this movie has the best odds at the best supporting actress pretty huge favorite minus 3500 and then emily blunt is after that i loved emily blunt and oppenheimer i thought this was one of if not uh the best performance of her career but this is i think a this is an easy win for Divine Joy Randolph. I'm glad that this movie is going to get some love at the Oscars in a year where one movie could dominate everything. I think that Oppenheimer was just so dude that if that it, like if Emily Blunt were to win when there were performances like Joy, I mean, and that, that's not taking away anything away from Emily Blunt, though. Like I said, she was awesome. But Divine Joy Randolph is going to win for sure, as she should. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if she's going to win for sure. She is obviously like the odds seem to indicate that. And uh, like, I don't think it was a runaway performance. Like she was great. She was just as great as as Giamatti. Uh, eh, I don't no, know. No, was I, I, Giamatti I, was great. He just has no chance of winning. She was really, really good. They were both awesome. I mean, really, yeah. the biggest who is that I got from this movie was her over Dominic Sessa. Uh, Agreed. I'll, yeah. I will note, though, this was not the best reunion between a director and actor this year because Yorgos Lanthimos and Emma Stone just went freaking crazy like only they can on poor things. Strong recommendation on this movie, as you said, because everybody's going to love it. If you want to see some really weird shit, go watch Poor Things. We've already reviewed it and explained why we loved it so much and why a lot of people probably are going to say, what the hell was that? Not for me. As much as this movie was like not evocative, that movie was. Yeah, like this is a good this is a good example of like one for me, one for you. If you have somebody who you think may not love Poor Things, but you you kind of want to get them on uh, on that path, say, hey, let's watch this one first. Let's watch the whole, do a double feature. Say, do the holdovers and then do poor things. Uh, uh, because you're guaranteed to win with the holdovers. You're not guaranteed to win with poor things. Uh, what did you give this? Or, uh, yeah, we're, we're not doing positives and negatives on this one, right? No, it, it's, I mean, it's, we kind the of. The only conversation is the positives and the negatives are. The negative is just that, like, it's, it's not the most. It's not the craziest. Yet. Or, yeah. like. Uh, yeah, it's not the biggest swing you've ever seen, but it delivers on on everything that it tr does try to do. Um, on Letterboxd, I gave it four and a half, which I realize is probably pretty high for what it is. But again, I think that it it crushes everything that it tries to be and maxes out what it is as an idea. And I just loved it. It's a personal favorite of mine. I, I can see it being a movie that I watch every single year around Christmas and we'll never stop loving. Yeah. I think I said on one of them, I give it a four and a half that I really wish was like a 4.1, but I'm not going to round down. I'd rather round up because I love everyone who made this movie. So four and a half for me as well. That is the holdovers. Let's not do this again. <laughs>